It's another day here at the Comeback Team Studios. This is your host, Beck Lover. And I have, honestly, a really exciting guest here. I'm really happy to have him. You might have seen him. You might have seen all of him. I have a very legendary man from the adult film industry, also known as porno. His name is Eric Everhart, and he's on the show. And we're going to take you deep into the world of adult entertainment, what it's like, the life, especially of a male porn star and what it's like after getting out of the industry and what he's working on now and eric i'm so glad to have you brother thank you very much man i'm glad to be here how you doing my friend great great you know it's a uh, it's a beautiful day out here we're in the uh, czech republic so not uh, not la based anymore not us based so different lifestyle different culture but things are great first and foremost anyone that knows anything about the czech republic knows that prague is by far one of the most beautiful cities in the world would you agree oh yeah from a, from an architecture standpoint I, I don't think there's there's different there's definitely not better in my opinion is that part of the reason why you went there i mean how did you end up in 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 in, in, in prague well okay so so we, we were starting this story uh previously so let's go into it um so my journey here was sort of the culmination of, I would say, a 10-year journey, right, that began in 2009. So 2009, you know, I'd been doing porno at that point for over a decade. You know, I'd, I'd gone from, you know, starting as a performer, becoming a director, becoming a, having my own production studio, you know, becoming one of the top guys in the world. Um, and then I took a, uh, I met a, a Bulgarian man, actually, Bulgarian man in 2008, 2009. And he was running some workshops. So I took this relationship workshop with him. It was really life changing for me in a lot of ways. And when I was doing that, uh, I got introduced to this uh, thing called NLP. People would talk about NLP, NLP, right? I'm like, well, what, what the fuck is that? Right? Yeah, what is that? Yeah, neuro linguistic programming. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now that's right? some very interesting stuff, bro. So, yeah. So I thought so too, right? I'm like, oh, man. Like this sounds, this sounds like something I could use for business. You know, maybe it's sort of like hypnosis, manipulation, something like that, right? Well, that's what they so make like, it oh, seem like on the surface. Like you can control, you know, like kind of basically program. I don't want to say the word program, but you can like influence the way someone perceives or thinks or, you know. Yeah, they, you can change the, 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 you could alter reframe their perceptions, change their belief structures about themselves. Using certain words. Ultimately looking to change their identity. Using certain words and phrases and, right? Phrases, uh, words um, through touch. You, you do a lot of touch anchoring. Um, so a lot of these things. So I thought to myself, I said, well, okay, this, this sounds great, right? And uh, so... I asked them, I said, well, where's the best place? Because I've always been one of those individuals where if I'm going to do something, I want to do the best. Like, I don't want to fuck around, right? So I said, okay, uh, where's the best place? And they said, well, there's this place up in Marin County in uh, Northern California, just outside San Francisco. I said, great, let's do it. That's where I want to go. So I went there back and uh, it was not what I was expecting at all. It was it was really interesting because it was, it was like a half mix of like, granola hippies and then super businessmen mixed in the same group together <laughs> but it was like it was it was honestly it was not what i was expecting it was the, the most holistic thing possible you know the guy that runs it he'd been one of the best nlp guys in the world and he was he'd come up with all these theories i mean stuff having to do with you know quantum universe all this crazy stuff and uh, basically i went through it for three years and it pretty much stripped away everything that I thought about myself. Like you ended so, up so you took all this, your childhood traumas. So you took this thing for three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going up. I was going up every month, every month to San Francisco. Wow. And for three years, and I wasn't even doing it because, I, like, I didn't want to be a practitioner. I was just, I got into it because I'm like, well, I want to change who I am, right? Like, I want to alter fundamentally my beliefs, my identity, and you know, because, I mean, let's let's face it. I don't think. Not all of us, you know, necessarily had the most happy of childhoods, right? You know, and it's like, well, 
there's a good thing to that because that's what pushes you to be something better when you get older, right? But, you know, unless you had the, you know, leave it to be of her childhood with the white picket fence and mom and dad were just loving people and, you know, nobody, you know, everybody was, you know, kumbaya, we got our own issues to deal with, right? So, um, so that's what happened was really, I spent three years just, you know, going through, like I said, all my childhood shit, all, all the stuff that was mm, holding me back in life. And then when I came out of it, I'll be honest, Beck, I was totally fucked up right? <laughs> in, in a good way. But, you know, I had all these existential questions now. It was like, well, what am I here to do? Right. What's my purpose? Well, let me life? ask you this. Now, this is after you decide to exit. Did you yeah. exit? Did you exit the adult entertainment industry at this point? No, no, I, I, I didn't. You um, were still working at this time. Yep. Yep. So you're still so making films. That. Um, you know, because I was, I was, I was lost now, you know, it's like, well, here's something that I've been, you know, and, and it's, it's something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs go through, right. Especially if they have a side hustle, like they're working on something, right. So you've got your day job, which is obviously that's paying the bills that keeps the light on. But then at the same time, you're working toward something else that, you know, is your bigger picture, your dream, your vision. Right. So at this point, like I come out of this school, and I'm just lost because it's like, well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing this because this is how I make my money, but I want to do something else. And I'm like, well, what, uh, what is it, right? What's, what's the thing that I'm going to do? Um, and so I sat with those questions for a long time. And that's actually what led to me eventually working with shamanic plant medicines. So this is how we get to how I ended up over here. So do you think that... Um Neuro linguistic programming. I'm not N like Nancy, L P like Paul. Yeah. Do you feel that it forced you to to really assess yourself and audit yourself and basically look? I mean, what, what did what, what did it, why was it so dramatic for you? What what did this whole process um, do to you? And do you recommend it? Do you recommend it something people study and look into? Oh, I can highly recommend it. I I, I used to joke, right? I always joked with. Um, the guy that ran the school, I said, Carl, his name was Carl. I said, Carl, you have a, like a, 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 um, a side deal with Kimberly Clark, you know, the company that makes the Kleenex. Cause yeah, so you sit in front of them and you do a two hour session. And by the end of it, you're just tears, you're crying, you know, you're dealing with the shit that happened to you when you were three years old. Cause it's all like, ultimately what I found out was most of the things that we deal with, you know, in our thirties, our forties, our twenties, our fifties, they're all things that happen between one and three years old. You know, and it a can be of, something like, man, you were hungry and mom was busy and you didn't get fed for five hours or six hours and you just sat there. And now you've made this, you've associated that with nobody is ever going to give me what I need. Right. And so then that becomes the, the, the thing that then propagates your life. And, you know, as we move on, you know, now you're 20. And so that's how you start interacting with the world. Or it could be, you know, um, things that have to do with money. Right can have to do with belonging. I mean, usually when you boil them down, they, they come down to belonging, uh, love, worthiness, like these super, super core things. But they're all things that happen between, you know, one and four years old for us. Do you, um, what was I going to say? So you do recommend people look into this. And now I know, no, I've also heard it and I think it's true and maybe you can confirm, but a lot of high profile people, powerful people have studied this stuff. Is that true? that true? Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you look at, uh, I mean, the classic example, I think would be like Tony Robbins. Like you look at Tony Robbins, he's very NLP based. Um, and so of course it depends where you, where you go for, uh, for help and, and, and who is the practitioner. I know the people that I went to, like I said, at the school where I attended and especially Carl, I mean, he's probably one of the most amazing, I mean, you would love him on your show. You would trip the fuck out. Let me this guy. Man. I would love to have him on, man. Yeah, he's uh, he's really he's really wild. But um, yeah, he would really have the ability to, you know, in in a lot of times, just in two hours, figure out what was what was your core belief that you had about yourself, and he would change it in those two hours. And that was good, and sometimes it was bad, right? Like I'll, I'll just uh, give an example. Um, one of his trainers. Uh, this it sounds very intense, by the way, bro. This oh yeah, oh yeah. But but one of one of his trainers, she um, she had one guy that um, that uh, came to her about a phobia, right? He had this phobia of um, being um, 
being in enclosed spaces, right? So he's had this phobia his whole life. And his, his dream, his whole dream in life was to be, um, to work on a submarine. And he never lived his dream because just completely, completely, completely terrified. Can't go into any place small, like nothing, right? So he did something else with ships or whatever, but it was like the nagging thing. And then he ended up going to her and she was able to fix it in two hours. And he had a complete mental breakdown because he suddenly realized he's like, I, I didn't live my dream for 40 years and somebody fixed it in two fucking hours. Wow. Like the guy went mental. Like it took him a long time to deal with that. Cause then, you know, he could do whatever. And it's like, well, the ship sailed. Like I'm, cause I think he was like 65 at the time or something. Right. It's like, wow. You're not, you're not going to be a sub captain anymore. Like that, that, you know, that's gone. One of my good friends told me about this. Um, he said he was the first time I'd ever heard the term. And he told me I should be looking into this. I mean, I think I still have a lot of work to do myself and I like things that are sometimes not forced and, mm -hmm. you know, um, it sounds very fascinating to me and I think I'm going to do a little bit more research on it, but, um, Oh yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, so this is not this, a big, I'll, a big, I'll give you all the information. You can, you can check it out. Is it expensive brother um, to, to take these sessions? I mean, no, I mean, expensive is relative. Um, I'm trying to think how much Carl charges cause he's one of the top, top guys. Well, Bob, is there's like a couple hundred a class. I mean, is it something crazy or? No, when, when you work with him one-on-one, -on -one, like a class at the school is different. So there's, um, when I did the, the class, um, All right, but it's not crazy exorbitant. No, it's not crazy. I mean, it would be like, like the, initial, course. the initial, um, like nine, nine classes or something. It's probably like 1500 bucks or something. That's like very that. reasonable. Like man. That's and reasonable. It's all day. Those classes are all day. But if you work with him just for two hours, it's like 500 bucks, I think, but that's one-on-one -on -one and it's clinical, but it's no joke. And it's, it's no joke. Wow. Man, we went off on a tangent, but that's why people like podcasts. So let, let's do this. Let's. <laughs> but anyways, so, so after that, um, I started working with, uh, ayahuasca. Have you, have you ever heard of ayahuasca? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, because I still had these questions, right? It was like, okay, well, what's my purpose? What am I here to do? And they were such nagging questions and there was no way, like I wasn't finding any answers, at least not in. But this... what were you feeling, brother? Were you feeling empty? Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a sense of emptiness and it was a, what's the point type it, feeling really what's the point? Like, what's my mission? Why am Very I here? Fucking dangerous, at that bro. point I was like, man, there's, you know, I mean, porno is great, but we're not saving the whales here. Right. Like, come on, let's be realistic. We were just entertainment. <laughs> right. You know, I, you know where I've noticed, cause I have some friends, um, uh, that I know that are professional poker players. And I've, I've seen a lot of them that have gone through that as well, because you know, they've got something where it's like, yeah, they make money, they become maybe millionaires. And then they're like, what the fuck is playing poker? And it's not doing anything, right? So. It's a game, man. Yeah, it's a game. So you kind of went through what I think a lot of um, celebrities and famous people go through when they kind of get to this pinnacle in their career and everything's going great. And then they just feel this emptiness. And I've seen it, man. But so you go on this whole journey. I kind of want to catch up to this part, but let's go backwards, man. Sure. So you, you, you experimented with ayahuasca. Did you go to like Peru or one of these foreign countries or you did it locally or? No, I, I, my, my first journeys were all in uh, California. What inspired you to do ayahuasca? Was it watching like Mike Tyson talk about it or Joe Rogan or? No, no, actually it was none of that. Um, it was through the, the individuals that I had gone to school with at uh, the NLP school. That's where I first heard about it. You know, it's like everyone's talking certain. about this, 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 this experience, man. It's like so many people and there's a lot of con artists out there too. You gotta be careful. It's like, everyone's talking about it, man. Everybody wants to do it now. And I'm not here to propagate that, but you feel it was beneficial to you. Do you feel that it, it helped you experience yes. what you were looking for? And, and I'm going to go with a lot of caveats here back because Good. I, I'm this, I'm the same way. I, I don't, I never tell people, Hey, you should do this right? Um, because it's fucking tough. It's yeah, we're not, not we're not here to give medical advice, seek a professional, take caution. But you're speaking for your own personal experience. Yeah, for me, how I would describe ayahuasca, it would be 10,000 hours of psychotherapy put into six hours. You're vomiting too when you first did it? Yeah, I've had um, one one journey in particular where I think I probably vomited 70 times. It was a lot of vomiting. Um, 
So that's not like, you know, that's why people like, you're not getting high. Like, this is not like some fun journey where you're, no, you're throwing up, you know, boogies coming. I heard you can even shit yourself when you're doing it, right? Thankfully, thankfully, Beck, I have not. But you can, myself. right? You know what? That's so funny that you say that because that's always been my fear. Every journey, it's like, because, because you know, they put you in this room, right? And so I, <laughs> I position myself right beside the toilet. I'm like, that was my worst nightmare. Thankfully, I just vomit so far. I just vomit. But uh, how many but times? I'll tell you honestly. How many times? I mean, you've, how many times you've done it, brother? What's that? How many times have you used it? Seven. I've done seven journeys. Um, and they're about I've six journeys. They're about six hours. What's that? They're about six hours long. Yeah, I would say if we're going for a, a, a median time amount, it's about six hours. I mean, it could be it could be four, it could be eight. Um, I've found generally six hours it, it it winds down and you're, you know, quote unquote sober. What right? are you seeing, man? Oh man. Is it different every time or the same thing? It's different every time. Um You see the elves? What's that? Do you see the mechanical elves like they say? No, you know, for me it's 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 such a personal journey. And this is the thing that's interesting, right? Like, you know, I think a lot of people when they do it, they think like, oh, you know, I'm gonna see this crazy stuff. Yeah, you see crazy stuff, but it's 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 so personal. Like I've seen relationships, uh, you know, in full disclosure, uh, one of the best journeys I ever had, I met my dead father. And I, I hadn't, you know, I mean, like he's dead. And we had a full on discussion. He was there. He gave me a hug. I mean, it, and it was more real than you and me talking right now. Some creepy shit too, but I gotta be honest with you. Because uh, well, I, 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 right? like I, 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 I have my, I have my theories about ayahuasca, but I don't want to get into it. Yeah, yeah. I have, I, I have I, some theories uh, about what could be actually happening when you guys do it, but we're not gonna. I don't want to creep everyone out. So yeah, I, I have but, no but idea that was crazy. Either, huh? It's uh, it's very healing and very profound, and it does change you. It does alter you because permanently. Um, yeah, I've, I've, from that's been my experience. I mean, you know, like I said, uh, for me. You know how I ended up here was uh, one of my ayahuasca journeys. The, the visions were so strong about moving over to this part of the world. Two months later, I sold all my worldly possessions, took my dog, and jumped on a plane. So literally, this these experiences you've had are the reason you're in Prague right now. Going back to my original question, hundred percent. But it wasn't an easy answer. We had to kind of show why you. Got... <laughs> we had to we had to paint the picture. But yeah, that's how I ended up here. So it wasn't like oh, I thought it was beautiful. Let me go there. It, it was literally, it's what you experienced in this journey. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why anyone that wants to consider doing what you've done, they need to understand that there will be some permanency to, to there's an, a lasting effect. I think I, I can't help but think of Mike Tyson, you know, when we saw him basically crying. There was a lot of videos of him on YouTube talking about I'm not shit. I ain't shit. And he was talking about these trips and these journeys. And it was almost like this frog poison was his God, you know, mm. literally the way he would describe the experience but i do believe that there's all types of different ways to cure things and i believe that there's a cure for everything on earth except yeah. for except for sexually transmitted diseases yeah that makes sense and look there's no cure for them yeah <laughs> but this is not my words this is what i've studied in my my, my long journey with theology and 25 years of research but it's just fascinating. The whole ayahuasca, the DMT, it just really does fascinate me. And I, I would like to, if not, if I don't even do it, I would like to just be present during the ceremony and see what what happens. And a good friend of mine, Eric Nice, who maybe you should talk to, and this is someone that was in the entertainment business also and changed his complete life. He was the first reality star ever on the real world. Maybe you remember him. New York mm, City. I don't remember him. I do remember the real world. But... Yeah, he was the first one on the first season. So okay. considered the first reality star ever. And um, he's out in uh, the desert and he changed his whole life. He left behind fame and he, he uses ayahuasca and the rituals and the ceremonies. And he's an extraordinary, he was an extraordinary human being before. He was always humble. That's one thing he always had. He was always just down to earth and cared about his friends. And, but uh, he, uh, he talks a lot about it and I just find it fascinating. I just really do find it fascinating. So I definitely want to go and I think I'm going to go out with him and just kind of maybe see what everyone else is doing and what, what it does to them, you know? Well, I, I don't think you could have a big ego and do it. Like, I don't, I don't know that those things go together because I'll tell you this, you know, the, the one thing that I had to really, really learn and I will tell everybody, 
is you need to fucking surrender because you know it's a it's a roller coaster baby once you drink it there's no getting off there's no taking anything to make it stop did you ever say when you first took it were you like what i do did that enter your mind at any moment oh more than one journey are you kidding me i mean i had i had one journey this i did in ukraine because i i knew some uh, some shamans out there so i go to ukraine and um and it was you know kind of funny because i took this i took this girl with me because she wanted to try it right so and they ran the ceremony a little different uh the 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 shaman there so he gave you half cups right instead of one full cup so i you know take the first half cup 20 minutes later he asked you if you not want another i say sure no problem take another so now i got a full dose i'm like okay now we're ready to go right (laughs) hour goes by nothing right seriously oh yeah i I thought it hits right away this was the funny thing right like and I've had this before where this has happened. I don't know why it's my metabolism. It's whatever it is. But so I'm like, fuck, like I took a full dose, like nothing's happening. And of course, people in the crowd are tripping balls, right? Like, and, you know, so after about an hour, Sasha, you know, and he says this only in English, of course, just for me, because I'm the only English speaker in the whole group. So I get this extra portion. I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay, that's for me. <laughs> so I go up there, take another half, right? Sit back down, wait another hour. Still nothing. What the f- now I'm like, fuck me. I'm like, that's one and a half cups. Like I should be, I should be crawling up the walls and I'm as sober. And of course, like I said, everybody's losing their mind in the room, right? Like crying, um, screaming, all kinds of shit. Well, y- y- you'll keep it under control, but you'll hear the vomiting and there might be some wailing, you know, if generally most shamans sounds will, like a blast, bro. <laughs> tell, tell people to quiet down, right? Cause you don't want people like messing with your trip. So people are respectful, but you'll hear all the vomiting. You'll hear this stuff. Right. And I'm like, Oh man. And so now I'm like, I'm fucking terrified. Cause I'm like, if I take a fourth one and they all hit me at once, I'll be fucked. Right. <laughs> and then I see, I see this little Ukrainian girl that I came with, right. Little blondie just gets up, goes over for the fourth one. I said, Oh fuck me. I have to do it now. Right. I can't look like a total pussy. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going. So, and Sasha just looks at me. He's like, he's like, nothing. I'm like, nothing. I go, what should I do? And he just gives me that perfect. I mean, you would know perfect Slavic stoic look on his face. And he's just like, "Hmm," just hands me the, hands me the cup. He's like, drink it. So, all right. I drank it five minutes later. Fuck my life. I thought I was going to see God. It was so terrifying (laughs) as a start, dude. It was, I mean, here's, here's the funny, the funny thing, right? Like I tried to explain this to somebody. Okay. I had read this book before the journey and from a famous shaman and the book saved my life because it was all about surrender. Cause I actually thought I was going to die and I had to be okay with it. I, I blasted off so hard, so fast. We're indoors in a nice, perfectly temperature controlled environment. In five seconds, I was so wet. I slicked my hair back. Wow. I mean, it was just, I literally, I didn't know I was going to make it. And, uh, and it turned out to be one of the most impactful journeys of my life. But the fact that you cannot control it and you really just need to say, okay, like that's the big word. It's like, it's just take me wherever you're going to take me. You have to say yes to everything. If you're seeing the, the most demonic things, it's yes. If you're seeing fucking bunnies and candy, which you could, it's yes. The answer is just always yes. You so just have to be open. Did you see demons ever? Me, no, I, my journeys, cause I, cause I have, I have, um, one friend who actually, uh, I, recently he started working with the medicine and he's seen some really traumatic stuff. I mean, also very healing, right? Like, so he, he is full agreement. He goes, it's some of the most amazing stuff, but he, his, his visions went really dark. Mine have never been super dark. Mine have been difficult, but not dark. So I think a lot of it is. A lot of it is your personality. A lot of it is whatever the medicine wants you to work on in your life. And another one is what is your intention when you go in? Because, you know, before you drink, you, you, you have a clear goal in mind. And almost, I would say almost every time, the medicine has directly shown me what it was my intention was related to. And that's a little strange that it can be that pinpointed from that perspective. We could do a whole episode just on on <laughs> Eric know, right? on Eric's the uh, Eric's ayahuasca journeys, man, because it's fascinating. I love I love listening to the stories, man. It's amazing. Um, let's take a step backwards. Gotta stick sure. to format. I always 
bring people into to your life, to your world. And you've kind of already let some of it out of the bag, but where does life start for you? What was the early life like in a nutshell? You know, don't go too crazy. And how the hell do you end up in the porn industry, man? Yeah. So early life, you know, I'm from Canada, you know, um, my, uh, my father's side, side of the family is uh, English. My mother's side is Ukrainian. So, so it's like a half, half mix. Um, now was your mom basically you're the, she, she was first generation in Canada. Like she was immigrated there. My or? mom, my mom is second generation. So she, okay. she only speaks English. She grew up understanding Ukrainian. Uh, my grandparents never spoke good English. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a different culture there because my grandparents didn't want to teach us because, you know, when they grew up, they got beaten in, in local schools if they spoke it in class. Right. So my grandparents just had this, like, no, you need to know English. So, um, from that perspective, yeah, there, there was no culture on that, on that level with the language, but, but definitely other things. Um, but yeah, just a, you know, very, very Canadian existence. Um, I had a couple kind of seminal moments that really affected my life. Um, when I was about five years old, I got, I got run over by a car and I think that really fucked me up in a lot of ways. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Yeah. We, well, which was really weird about it. Um, How the hell was that? Funny, I've never actually shared this with anybody in any sort of live thing, but, uh, um, yeah, it was, it was strange because, um, my, uh, long story short, my father had a flat tire. He had to go get my mom's car cause she had the, you know, the spare and stuff in it. And, uh, Parked, he parked the car on one side of the road and his car was on the other and he went to go fix it. Of course, he told you know his two sons, hey, stay in the car. Well, I was always the rebel. I'm not listening to that. So I crawled out the window to go see what he was doing, ran across the road and he watched me get run over in front of him. Wow. That's a parent's worst nightmare, man. Yeah. So I was, I, so my leg was broken and my head was, was pretty lacerated. Um, but, you know, after that, it was weird because I think probably due to the trauma and stuff, um, I got really fat. So, so growing up, I was really, I became a really heavy kid. Right. Um, and that didn't change until really when I got into high school and I joined, um, uh, high school football, then I got into bodybuilding and then I was just hooked. I was like, Oh wait, we can, you can transform how you look. I'm in. Right. So, uh, you know, people now they, you know, cause I'm 44 and they're like, wow, like these girls will be like, how are you 44 with a six pack? I'm like, well, if you, if you were traumatized as much as I was as a kid, like watch how I eat now. Right. It's like fucking sweet potatoes and some egg whites all day long. So that's all you eat. You eat healthy, you eat very healthy. Oh, yeah. Super healthy. Super healthy. It's, it's something that I, you know, I, I talk about also in, in my teachings, you know, in the clients that I work with, you know, just, you know, you're so much of your sexuality and, and your ability to function, you know, like, and deliver, you know, quote unquote, a world-class lay in the bedroom. Like a lot of it really starts with, okay, like how good is your diet? Right. You know, what is your fitness levels? Like all these things affect because non-existent for me. So the, 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 the last thing, the last thing that's going to want to work is your dick, right? If nothing else is going, if nothing else is working there, like the last uh, thing that's going to want to work is your dick. We're getting there, bro. <laughs> we're going to have to pull the emergency cord here and start working out and get those yeah. testosterone levels higher. Yeah. So you go through some pretty crazy stuff, man. Now, did I understand correctly earlier that your pops wasn't around when you were younger? No, no, no. He was around. He was around. Oh, he was um, around. Okay, okay. So, no. He might, oh, you're talking my, about my your grand... You're talking, about your, you're talking um, about your grandparent in that ayahuasca journey, right? Sorry? Who did you see in the ayahuasca vision? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying oh, to... Oh, no. It was my father because my father died in 2000... Um, 2014. Okay. Okay. So I, I was mixing it up. I was under the impression he passed when you were young. So no, no, he um, passed when I was older, but you guys were close. Know, the, the thing was, we didn't, we didn't, we never had, um, we never had the best relationship, right. Which was my fault. I mean, it was you know mutual, whatever. But so, you know, when he, when he did pass away, um, I just felt like there was, there was so much that was left unsaid. Right. That we didn't really get to say like, Hey man, you know, like, sorry for being a shitty son, but you know, we, I love good, you. Right. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. I was whatever, but I love you. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so that, that was really the experience that we got for that time was we got to just kind of see like, you know, okay, it's, it, it's all good. And, you know, and this was, um, uh, this was, you know, we're good. So yeah, I think really that's, I think that's the biggest regret people have is when someone passes that, there were certain things that you knew you had to say and that you knew you should have said. 
and you knew that you might regret it if they pass. You actually had these thoughts, and then they do die. Yeah. And you knew yeah. that you should have said it a long time ago. And that's a very hard feeling to process, man. Oh, 100%. When you knew you, you could have just picked up the phone. But, but the uneasiness of having that conversation, the, uh, you know, because it's, you know, maybe you're not comfortable. You know, like, I don't know how, you know what I'm trying to say. There's like this uneasiness of like, I want to say it. But for some reason, you just can't muster the courage to say what you really want to say, what's in your heart to someone you care about or whatever the case may be. And uh, I've had some of that experience in my life too, brother. And then with my father, uh, absolutely. I can see and I understand exactly what you're saying. Like my dad gets on my nerves maybe, let's just say hypothetically, and I want to just, you know, maybe I don't agree with everything he does and how he does it. He has his ways. He's old school. He's iron. He's a man made out of iron, basically. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, you want to kind of reach out and say, listen, man, I just think we can maybe chill a little more. I want to hang out a little more. Maybe we can just avoid talking about shit that triggers both of us and just let's chill. Like, let's just go for a walk or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. But now nah, I'm glad that I've, you know, overcome that where, you know, listen, I wasn't an angel growing up. There's no doubt about it, but I'm glad that I was able to many times tell my father, you know, hey, because I was always, f I experienced so much death in my life that I know you don't have time. Time is your enemy. And if you got something you need to say, you better say it because the regret is worse than the uncomfortable feeling of saying it or getting it off your chest. Would you agree the regret is worse than actually? Oh, just oh yeah. Way worse. Way worse. You so know, I hope if someone's listening, I hope this helps you. If you have something you want to say to somebody you love or whatever the case may be, you might not have it tomorrow. So take it from me and Eric. Go say what you got to say before it's too late. Well, and to go on to your point, like, like it totally changed the relationship I have with my mother. Like me and my mom have the best relationship ever now, you know, because, you know, not only do we, we both say to each other, whatever, whatever we're feeling in the moment, Right. We enjoy our time together. Um, you know, we I've taken my mom now around the world because she never experienced anything. You know, as soon as my dad died, it was like I told her, I said, well, now he, like you have no excuse because she'd never seen Europe. Right. She'd never been anywhere. So I said, where do you want to go? And she's like, well, I never thought about it. I said, great. Pick a country. She said, Italy. I said, fuck, get on the plane. Let's go. You have all these uh, experiences. You got ran over by a car. I mean, how were you in school, man? Were you, you know, were you a good student? Super smart. At least growing up, I was. That changed when I went to when I got went to university because I uh, I um, talked my way in is a good way of saying it, but I I sort of I worked the system and I got into the number one comprehensive university in the in the country, and I shouldn't have been there. Let's face it, I shouldn't have been there. And uh, <laughs> and man, you know, not not to not to be you know rude towards them, but I will t uh, you know. So this isn't meant in a racist way or anything, but. You can't compete with the Asians, man. You fucking can't. <laughs> you're compl you're you know, compliment. You're not. You're not. You know. You're compliment. You're saying they're they're brilliant. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because I mean, I was. Uh, you know, Vancouver has a huge Asian population, and and man, those fuckers work. Man, they work so hard. And I was not. You know, I was used to getting by because I was like, you know, I was smarter than the average guy in high school, right? But that doesn't. You know, it's like anything. Like, look at. Uh, I'm sure you've interviewed you know, sports athletes, right? Well, how many, how many kids were really good at playing hockey or football in fucking college? Well, there's a big difference between college and pros, right? You know, and, and it's the same thing that I noticed, you know, I mean, sure, there's, there's probably a ton of guys that, man, they think they're the king in bed, but let's, let's put you in a town square with, you know, the cops watching and, you know, whatever else shit is going on and see if you can pull off a hard on, like, it's not easy. And it requires, like, you got to have built that skill. Like, you can't just rely on like, you know, the winds of hopefully my dick gets hard. Like that's not pulling you through. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing, right? Like I was there and it's like, you know, these kids are studying, studying, studying. And I'm like, man, I never had to study in, in high school. Right. Wow. Did you fail out? No, but what I did was I was, uh, I was disillusioned. So I, I dropped out. I didn't fail. I dropped out and I went into massage therapy school because, uh, you know, at the time, um, I was, uh, I was working at this uh, gym and that was like a pivotal moment in my life because 
you know, that was the time when I really met a lot of like hyper masculine sort of mentor figures because the gym that I worked at, it was, it was super hardcore and it was basically every avatar of meathead that you could possibly ever meet. Right. We had hell's angels. We had police. We had one guy went to the world's strongest man. We had, you know, bodybuilders. I mean, you know, you had guys shooting up each other with steroids in the kitchen. I mean, it was this kind of gym, right? Like it was just super hardcore. So you start working in the gym, you start going to Muslim. Let let me, let me ask you another question. How early, how young do you become sexual active? Oh, me. I had just turned 17. Just turned first something. time. Good experience. Was yeah, it a girlfriend? No, was it a girlfriend? Was it, it was, a girlfriend? Was it a girlfriend? Was it funny? Because um, me and the girl, we were both virgins, so it was like we're both like just kind of trying to figure shit out, right? Um, so yeah, good experience. I mean, I can reflect back and I can say, man, that was some fucking bad sex, right? But you know, you don't know what you don't know, and I think this is where a lot of people struggle, is because you know you can't you can't fundamentally say something is good or bad unless you've really sampled everything or sampled enough to have a real sense of what is good or bad. You know, it's like, you know, I I could say, Hey Beck, what's your favorite ice cream? Right. And if all you've ever had to taste is strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla, well, you're going to tell me one of those three, right? You're going to be like, Hey man, I'm a vanilla guy. I take you to 101 flavors. And now you might be like, Oh man, Fuck that pistachio. Oh God, that was so good, right? But don't you think that's how men view women? Uh, I think there's a, a lot of, of men. Not, I'm not saying all men, and, but there's a lot of men that say, I want to try a million women. I want to, they want to do what you did basically. There's a lot of men from the, I would say from the, from the hedonistic perspective that would want to really try and be with all types of different women of different cultures and, um, it's an appetite, bro. It's an appetite. It's just like someone that loves food and can't stop eating. I think there's a lot of men out there that, I mean, would you agree that there's a lot of men out there like that? I mean, or am I just generalizing? Yeah, no, I, I do agree. And and what I want to go into is there's there's a positive aspect and a very negative aspect. Do it. you feel that you started with that? Did you did you feel when you had that innocent first you know time? Because it's innocent. You were both, don't know what you were doing. Yeah. Did you feel right away like, damn, I have an appetite to do a lot more of this? Or did you feel like I would like to be a one person, be in love? I mean, would, would love ever enter your mind, man? Like of being married? I mean, did you ever oh, have any yeah. of these love, thoughts love, when love you were younger? In my mind, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, still, I, I would, uh, I would like to have kids. Definitely 100%. Because I think, especially for me, like now I, I realize how much wisdom I have to give them, right? Um, so to, to answer your point, yeah, there is that 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 insatiable sort of hunger here's the thing and here's where i really um now have come full circle with it and this is one of the things that i i try to impress upon people because i think i think one of the reasons why you have so much infidelity and people cheating is because they always think the grass is going to be greener on the other side the part for me where I've gotten to is I've tried every other side there is. There's a, there's a, so there's a positive and a negative to that. You know, the positive is that then when you, then you can really understand and, and make a very conscious decision to choose what it is that's in front of you when you decide, okay, what it is that I have, I'm happy with. And I think that's a big difference because I think most people, they don't really know if they're happy. Like they think, well, you know, it's okay. Ooh, but maybe that's better, right? Like that shiny object syndrome. So, you know, for me now, it's like, okay, well, I, I, I know what I know what qualifies as good sex and I know what does not for me, right? Like that's very clear for me. So it's like when I find it, I say, okay, I don't need to look further because I'm very, very happy with what I what I have and where I'm at. And I think that's a big big thing that some people are missing because you know they 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 just don't really know like they haven't really figured out what is good sex to them or what really turns them on or what they really like so they just kind of end up in a relationship with somebody and they're like well okay hey we don't piss each other off like let's do this right but they haven't really figured out those things and what they want and i think you know i think that's why you find so much so much infidelity, so much you know, people running off because you kind of have to go one way or the other, right? Like you either have to have experienced nothing, 
you know, so it's like, hey, you're a virgin, she's a virgin, you get married. Awesome, because you have no, there's nothing to compare against, it against you. There's so no point that, of reference. It's just what, what happened and you're with that person the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but ignorance is bliss, right? Like if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know it. So it's good. It's, it's if you're in that in-between zone where you like, well, okay, so I've sampled a couple things, but I don't really know what I like, so I want to just keep sampling and then it never ends. It's like a box of chocolates on the end, right? It's like, it's like when, you, when, you, when you pop the Pringles, right? And <laughs> once you pop, you can't stop. Um, so you, you, you're basically now in the fitness world. You're working out. You kind of put school on hold. Mm -hmm. You start with body massaging, I guess, is what it sounds like. Yeah, I was, doing, I was uh, going to massage therapy school. And that, when I was there, that's how I ended up getting into porno. How did that happen? So, so uh, I was on lunch break, um, and um, I'm sure they've got some sort of um, newspapers like it in, in New York. But uh, in, uh, in Vancouver, they had a, a newspaper. It was called the Georgia Strait. And they had, like, you know, the, you know, the band listings, like what's going on in the city, that kind of shit. And uh, just on lunch, I'm going through the paper, and then I flip, I flip the page, and suddenly it's like, bam. There's this, you know, four inch by four inch ad and it's saying, you know, looking for um, women or couples to do a porno movie. And previously I had lived with this one uh, girl for two years. We were dating. Right. And, you know, on occasion we would watch porno movies together and she used to always joke with me. She'd be like, oh, you got a huge dick. You could do porno. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, sweetheart. Like whatever. Right. Because, you know, you're dating any girl. She's going to tell you, you are amazing. You know, she's not going to be like, you're the worst lover ever, but I'm still going to date you. Right. So, so I was like, yeah, 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 whatever, sweetheart. And, um, but when I saw that ad, we had already broken up and I saw it. And I said, huh. It's like, man, like Debbie always said, I'd be good at that. So I thought, oh, fuck it. That, that sounds cool. So I called him up. And, um, you know, right on cue, like every good porno company should do, they hung up on me, <laughs> which, uh, which so as I got the point? Business, what was the I point? totally understood because. What was the point of the ad though? Well, so the thing was, you know, they, uh, they were looking for, basically they were looking for women, right? They weren't looking for guys. That was the, really the thing. And the reason was because they had already experienced what I experienced in the business was that. 99% of guys can't do it. You get there, there's the pressure, there's the hot lights, there's the girl that maybe likes you, maybe doesn't like you. There's the, you know, cameraman smoking behind the camera, whatever. You got the lighting crew that they all want to go home to their families <laughs> and they really want you to fucking get your shit together. I mean, you know, as I became super professional, um, you know, it was, it was funny because, you know, I'd show up on these sets and these were like grizzled, grizzled, um, lighting technicians you know they've been doing porno for like 30 years especially in la right forever and they were always so appreciative when i showed up because they were just like yep we're going home on time today everyone awesome you know because that's all they care about they do not give a fuck about you in any other way it's like man they got families they got kids they got a dog at home they don't want to be on set for 15 hours with you with a limp noodle in your hand trying to figure it out like they got lives right so um so what i learned you know was that just most guys couldn't do it. And that's why very few companies, like if you called saying like, Hey, I'd like to be a porn star. They say, don't waste our time. Cause you, you could know, call and say, I have like a eight, I, money. I have an 18, 18 inch <laughs> will hang up the phone on you. Right. Oh yeah. Because there's no, I mean, now speaking eight, of size, brother, I mean, how big is you? Me? Uh, seven by seven. And that's an honest man. What does that mean? Seven by seven, asshole. seven inches wide. Yeah, seven inches in circumference and seven inches long. In, in the porno business, they always referred to me as, as the Christmas tree, which was funny. I'd show up on set, and the first thing the director says is like, hey, Merry Christmas, sweetheart. <laughs> so Because it goes like a triangle, but it gets, gets seven inches around at the bottom. So in spectrum to most men, if we're looking about the general population, would you think that the size you have is classified in like what, the top point? I mean, what is normal? Do you even know? Have you ever studied any of this stuff? Like what's, what's considered a normal size for a man? Just normal, like decent. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an interesting question because, you know, I mean, when you look you online, go, they say like six inches, five, six probably, inches. Yeah. Probably between five and six. It would be normal because, you know, you have to understand in, in, in porno, 
nobody ever stays in porno that's that's normal like you know I've, I've often said to people if you wanted to be a superstar in porno there's five things that you require right number one you need to be able to get a hard on in any situation at any time within about five minutes that's crazy man number two you need to produce a cum shot ideally within about two minutes of being asked not before and not later right number three you need to be you don't need to be hung like a horse, but you need to be bigger than average just because logistically you've got camera angles. Well, for one, it sells. Number two, you functionally need to be able to see what's going on and you get some guy who's super small. It's shadows like you can't see nothing. Number four, you should be decently good looking. Doesn't mean you need to be Brad Pitt, not at all. But if you are super, super bad looking, most A-list girls won't want to work with you. So you'll never become famous. And then the most important one, number five, um, and which is really the most important, was you need to be able to create or extract something from the woman that would not have occurred if you specifically were not in the scene with her. So if you go in there and you're, you know, you're, you're there for that hour and a half, that two hours, and if you can make her forget that there's 15 other weirdos on the set staring at her, that there's the guy with the cigarette in his mouth, that you got the catering department over there, that you got the lady, you know, doing the makeup. If you can make her forget about all that for the next hour, you've done your job. How do you end, like, so do you call them, they hung up the phone, did you end up pursuing that company? I mean, what, what happens? How do you end up in the game, man? Yeah, yeah, so. Um, Were you pissed so when they, they hung, they up, hung on up on me, right? And I thought, okay, fine, go back to massage therapy. So going back to school, uh, it's about six months later, seven months later. Again, same scenario. Lunch break, reading the newspaper, turn the page, bam. That same fucking ad is there again staring me in the face, right? And I'm like, ah. I'm like, man, I really didn't pursue that hard enough. So I started making a real honest effort. So I started calling and I called and I called. And of course they, you know, no, not interested. No, not interested. No, not interested. I kept calling, calling, calling. One day I get somebody new on the phone. So finally I get somebody else answering the phone. And this actually turned out to be the owner of the company. And so he goes to me, he goes, well, he goes, tell you what, why don't you come down to our studio? We'll take some Polaroids of you, see if you've got the equipment. And you know, maybe one day, we can get you a job. I'm like, wow, fuck. It's better than being hung up on, right? I'm like, solid. So I go down there and they had this studio. It was like, I don't know if you've ever been to Vancouver, but there's oh, this dude, Vancouver. area of Vancouver. I love Vancouver, man. My aunt lives in Squamish, man. Oh, okay. So you know East Hastings, right? Uh, I'm somewhat, feel, I'm not going to say an act like I know every neighborhood, yeah. but I love yeah, Vancouver, it's, bro. It's, it's an amazing place. Yeah. Well, East Hastings was like, you know, it's close to where the hooker stroll is, the junkies. Like, it's not. Is the that like where the nightclubs are? There's a couple of nightclubs down there. Uh, further down, not at, not here, but yeah. But I mean, when you go way downtown, it's like a strip, clubs. kind of. Yeah, we, yeah. Hastings. There's, bar, there's bars, east and west Hastings. So yeah, bars, east hang was out. not nice. West is nice. Okay. So, so you go to this place. Yeah. So I go there. Um, go up. Uh, knock on their door. They had this big steel door knock on it and um, you know they op they open it up and they just look at me and they go hey are you Mitch I'm like yeah because that's my real name and uh, the guy just looks me deadpan in the face and just says can you fuck a girl for us right now and I was just like you gotta imagine I'm 21 right like I was just like like it was the last thing I expected to come out of our mouth like I remember I remember I just let out this tiny little squeaky like yep kind of like that and uh, yeah, it, they, they had had, there was this actress who was a stripper in Vancouver and she happened to be hanging out at their studio. I showed up and they said, you know what? Fuck it. She's here. He's here. All right, kid, let's see if you can do it. That was how it started. So that was your audition. It wasn't even, can you get hard enough? Just go. No, it was just like, we're throwing you in the fire. Let's see if you can do this. Right. And, um, you know, so I, I, I do it hard on, no problem doing the sex scene. I remember it was funny because I remember they came in and they, you know, I laugh now because, you know, in L.A., they would never say it like this. But they were like, you know, any time in the next like 10 minutes, if you could produce a cum shot, that would be awesome. And I was just like, OK, so like one minute later, cum shot. Like, honestly, I didn't think anything about it. Like, I didn't think it was special. I didn't think shit. And I didn't think I was going to be doing this again <laughs> to me. To me, I'm going to be honest. Back. 
here was my whole thought process. Cause remember I'm 21. Right. And I'm just thinking like, this is going to be the best story when I'm in diapers in the old folks home playing poker. I'm going to have the best story in the fucking old folks home. Right. That was my whole thought. Like, I'm like, I'm, I like collecting stories. So, um, you know, it was all done. They gave me some money and I was like, wow, fuck what I'm getting paid for this. Cause at the time I was working as a security guard in a, in a woman's clothing store. Right. So I was getting paid. Like, I think I was getting like seven bucks an hour or something like that. So like I made more money, you know, in, in this short period of time than I'm working a full shift for them. I was like, damn, okay. Right. And that was it. I went home figured that was it. And then um, it was about three days later, my phone rings, you know, it's that company calling and they just say, you know, they say, Hey man, can you come by and do that again? And that's where it started. Wow. So they loved you. Yeah. And then, you know, then it was um, about uh, eh, probably six months later, I, I started doing some work for them. And one day the, uh, the guy who edited the movies for him, we were talking because him and me were friendly and he said, look, he goes, the owner will never tell you this, but you're really good at this. You should think about going down to LA. You can make yourself some serious money. And I, again, you know, like it's so green, right? I'm like, what, there's money in this? Like real money? He's like, yeah. And um, at that time. So he lit you up. He gave you a little guidance. Gave me a little guidance. And then, you know, there was the most influential guy in my life up to that point, which was uh, one of the members of the gym where I trained at. And uh, he was, he was... Yeah, he was definitely like, I would say my mentor as, as a young guy, because, you know, he was the only self-made businessman that I knew, like he was a real entrepreneur. Now, granted, he was the drug dealer of the gym, right? But, you know, he, he was, you know, five foot four and like four feet wide, drove the black Corvette, had the Rolex, all the shit, but super nice. And he just saw something in me where he's like, man, like this guy's a go getter. And, uh, you know, when it came out that I'd done, I'd done, you know, a porno scene, like amongst the, the gym crowd, he was like, oh man, we got to look into this. So, um, I remember, uh, there was a famous porn actress that was coming through Vancouver just on like a signing tour. And he said to me, he goes, he goes, Hey, we got to go. We got to get some information. Right. So we go. And I had, at that point I had like two VHS box covers in Vancouver that had come out like, and you could see my face. Right. So it's like, I wasn't bullshitting. So we go to this, to this woman, we lay down the box covers and I say, look, I'm sure everybody is, is blowing smoke up your ass that they want to be a porn star. There's my face. There's my dick. It's hard. I've done this. I want to know, like, what does it take to be down in bank or be down in Los Angeles? And she was so nice to us, man. She spent like 25 minutes with me. She just laid it all out. She's like, well, okay, well, you know, if you're good, you could work this many days a week, you could charge this much money. Like she's laying it all out. And then she gave the end, the she says, here's a couple of phone numbers. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She was so nice. She was so nice. And it was, it was really funny because she ended up um, having fun. It was, about, it was about a decade later, probably about a decade later, her and me actually ended up working together in LA and she remembered me. And it was, she was like, she was like, Oh my God. She goes, you're the, she goes, I'm the reason that you're here and you became a star. I said, yep. It's all because of you. So she's a big name. In the, in the... Yeah. Yeah. She was, um, Diana Lauren. She was one of the vivid video girls back in the day. Diana Lauren. Yeah. She's still in the game or she's retired now. Oh no, for sure. She's retired. She, um, uh, but she was fabulous. I mean, I, I couldn't, uh, what was it like? What was it like? Nicer. What was it like working after that? It was comfortable, a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was funny cause I had so much respect for her. Can you mentor time. basically? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she, <laughs> she, she was the whole reason because if, if, if it had been anybody else, you know, she could have been bitchy. She could have not given any sort of help. And she, she just understood. She's like, okay, he's not, he's not full of shit. He's actually doing this. Yeah. I'll give him the help. So after this little crash course you have with her, you end up, sounds like you went to that. Sounds like you went to LA brother. Yeah. So, so this was um, a couple months later. When does the name come? The name? Everhart. Oh, yeah, that came actually from the, the crew at the gym. That actually came from the drug dealer. So he actually named me. It was hilarious. So you had this name in Vancouver. You had this name in Vancouver. You, you Before you went to LA, you were already known as Eric Everhart. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was a day because, you know, we we're sitting around the gym. You know, it's just a bunch of us meatheads. And, uh, and you know, that's what the guys said. They say, oh, fuck, man, you, you got to have a name, right? 
And so I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the fuck, you know, what should my name be? Right. <laughs> and literally Jeff pipes up. It was hysterical because, you know, uh, it took him all of 10 seconds. He just goes, Eric Everhard. Right. And we were all looking at him like, and then he goes, he goes, I'll tell you why, because I saw your dick in that, in that video and fucking thing was pointing at the sky. It never went down. So you're fucking Everhard. And then he goes, and look at you, you're blonde. You look Nordic. So it's Eric and you need alliteration like Jenna James, Vince Boyer. So it's Eric Everhard. And then he goes, and you need to spell it with a K. And literally, like, imagine, like, all these super fucking, like, 300-pound, like, dudes, right? We're all just sitting there with our mouths open, like, Jeff, that's fucking genius. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, owe, I owe a lot of shit to Jeff. But, yeah, my name was because of him. Still talk to him. Jeff? You still talk to him? No, he actually passed away. Um, Sucks, bro. 2014, I think. A it was. good friend throughout the whole time, throughout your life? What's that? He was a good friend. He stayed in your life for a while, or yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, to to this day, there's nobody, there was nobody that that really, you know, I had two people when I look back that really altered the course of my life, and he was one of them because um, he he got me thinking in in a totally different way, and it wasn't, it was just that before that, I didn't really believe anything was possible. And you, and I'm probably, you've met this, you know, like you meet entrepreneurs, you meet people that are going out there to make big things happen. They don't actually believe they're going to fail. First of all, they've got a super positive mentality. Like I didn't have positive people in my life, growing up, but he was beyond positive. He was like, man, anything you put your mind to, you can make it. And he was really adamant on that. And I remember th this was, this was key. When we finished um, that little uh, meeting with Diana and we left the porno video store, as soon as the door closed and we got outside, he just looked at me. He says, hey, man, he goes, I have a gut feeling. And he goes, and my gut's never been wrong. He goes, I think you can be a big star. He goes, so if you want to go down to L.A. and pursue this, he goes, I'll back you financially to get down there. And uh, I dropped out of school the next week. And then you go to L.A., huh? And then I went down to L.A. So basically, brother, know. walk us into to, to be getting to the point where you're one of the top male porn stars in the world. You end up working with the likes of Sylvia Saint, which any oh, guy, yeah. any guy that's ever you know rubbed oh. one out back in the day, they know who she was. I mean, she was a legend in the industry. So I mean, you worked with some of the biggest names, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Well, it's still to this day, I think she was probably one of the prettiest girls of all time in the business and really nice real sweetheart too she was a really really nice girl so you end up in la so what do you do you, she gave you some phone numbers you called those numbers and they they brought you in or what happened yeah so there was there was a couple of things that went into it first um i had uh i put together with the help of the editor for the the company that i worked with in vancouver we put together um these show reels you know because remember this is pre-internet there's no email there's no nothing like that it's vhs yeah, so we, video cassettes. We, we, we dubbed all these VHS tapes. I probably made like 30 or 40 tapes and they were edited with, um, it was literally, there was just some, some footage of me, like some workout footage and there was footage of me fucking girls. And then it was like a five minute reel with some music and we mailed them all out. Like I got an old, you know, I got one of those AVN magazines. We found every address of every big company and man, we were just shipping tapes, just shipping tapes. And, uh, and out of all of that, we had, there was three people that contacted me back. So I probably pushed out like 20, 30 tapes, three people contacted me. And one of them was a producer in Philadelphia. And this was, this was 1998, um, New Year's Eve turning to 99. So my first professional shoot, like in America was actually in Philadelphia. So I went for this producer down in um, Philly worked for him. That went well. Uh, the girl that was there gave me a couple of phone numbers. So she said, okay, well contact these people. And you know, the first week of January or second week of January was, um, the consumer electronics show. And back at that time, all the porn stuff was actually still part of the consumer electronics show. So I went to that show and again, I came armed with another 20, 30 VHS tapes. So I'm going to every booth, I'm meeting directors, producers, and I'm handing them a tape. Because it's the same thing. Like I say, hey, I want to do a porno. They go, yeah, yeah, we've heard that from like a thousand guys today that said they want to do a porno, right? Like, fuck off. So I said, no, serious. Here's my card. Here's my video reel. 
blah, blah, blah. So I did that. Then the next month I actually went down to LA. So uh, I went with my, my friend, Jeff, the drug dealer. We went down together because um, he knew LA. He, he used to spend a lot of time there because I'd never been to LA in my life. So um, yeah, he gets me down there, uh, hooks me up with a one room cockroach filled apartment in North Hollywood in the ghetto. Uh, it was uh, 395 bucks a month. And, uh, and then he left me with 300 bucks in cash. And he said, okay, man, now it's all up to you. Like you gotta do this, right? Well, said, he left okay. you. He gave you three hundred dollars. and said, F- "Off." <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, he was like, "Man, now you gotta make it happen, right?" Like, like that's it. Like here, I got you. I paid for one month's rent. I gave you three hundred bucks. You're on your own. Like, like you gotta make it happen. And um, and that was really powerful for me because uh, I and I think a, a lot of people they get so used to having a safety net. You know, I think just in life, right? Like every time I've been successful back every time, it's when I have really like um, made it so I had no option other than success. Back against the wall. Like, yeah, death, death, jail, or success. That was it, right? So it's like, okay, like I, I, there's no mommy and daddy. There's nobody to help me out. I have one month to make this happen. And uh, so I, I got to, he connected me with one guy at... Um, uh, at the gym at Gold's North Hollywood. And that guy who worked there, you know, you know, I chatted him up and he said, Hey, you know, there's, there's a porn guy that trains here. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He goes, if he comes in, I'll introduce you. So next week I go in there and, uh, and one of the you know top performers of his generation, Vince Boyer used to, used to train at this gym. And, you know, Vince is from uh, Boston. So he's very East coast, you know, kind of, a, you know, Hard. never smiles. Yeah. Very, his name is Eric Everhard. <laughs> exactly, right? exactly, what's your right? name he was like what's your name son <laughs> eric everhart eric everhart with the boston accent right is that how you talk 100 100 i remember when i first Can met him he, he said to me he goes he goes he goes he was damn like uh he was you got a lot a lot a lot, lot lot to live up there too you know because he goes you got to live up to that reputation he goes he goes my name's boyer i just like to watch he goes you better fucking stay hard the whole time so yeah he broke my balls on that one but uh, no, I met him, you know, and he was just, uh, he was very short and to the point. If you think you about know? it, your name probably attracted some of these people too, because you're, you're, you're claiming that you can stay hard. Yeah. So that's like a I mean, huge thing for the probably What, what the they call this Canadian guy ever hard. Who the does this guy think he is? But they probably wanted to see if it was true. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, it was, it was funny because, um, you know, the business was so different back then too. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it's morphed over the last, you know, 23 years that I've been in it. But, uh, but back then it was very much, you could either do it or you couldn't, you know, there was no such thing as Viagra. There was none of this shit. It was like, man, you, you, you either could do it or you couldn't. And it was really apparent really quick, right? Like they would start a scene and, you know, either the guy would be pointing at the ceiling within two minutes or it was like one hour and it was like a limp noodle and they're just like, okay, call it. Like everybody go home. Wow. So, yeah, but I, so I met Vince and he said, Hey man, he goes, well, he goes, there's a gangbang next week. Show up. And, uh, that was actually at the time a shoot for one of the biggest companies in the world at that time. It was called anabolic video productions. And those guys, I mean, we're talking old school porno, like they were printing money with the stuff because you know this is no there was no free shit online it was like they were selling more tapes than almost anybody and uh and so that was my first production and um and i did really good you know and this was you know when they did a gangbang it's like you, you're sitting there okay it's not the easiest of situations right you got like they would have probably 20 or 25 dudes of which they would because they paid top rates right so every top actor this was the one gangbang every top actor would go and do because first of all, every top actor worked for this company at the time. Like they had a policy where they would hire the guys first and the women later because back then they wanted the best performances. And so they were, they were so focused on having the right guys because if you didn't have the right guys, you, you, you couldn't do what they wanted. Right. So, so here I was, I was thrown into this, you know, this, you know, chaos with the best guys and I was able to hold my own and exceed so when it was all done you know I was getting ready to go home and Vince comes up to me he goes hey man he goes what are you doing tomorrow I'm like nothing and he just looked at me he goes he goes you're working tomorrow 
and that was it. And then, uh, oh man, it was probably two months later, he took me over to Budapest, Hungary. Um, and that was my first trip internationally. And then after that, I just, I flew everywhere for that company because they would, they would just fly their guys everywhere. Like I went to Costa Rica, I went to Dominican Republic. They took me to Czech Republic, you know, uh, different sets, so different scenes, different movies, different films, different stars. Yeah. Yeah, so they would, because they, what they would do is they would fly the guys in and they would get g local girls. So they would fly all us Americans in and put us up in hotels and do the whole thing. And then they would have either Hungarian girls, Czech girls, Russian girls, Dominican girls. And, uh, and we would just go to work and then they'd fly us back into the States. They're like, the Americans are here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Americans are invading. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy, man. Crazy times. The Americans and one Canadian are here. They're here to... <laughs> Um, so you're just, it seems like, bro, you were just natural at this, man. Like you're mentally, you're able to handle the pressure. You're yeah. well endowed mm -hmm. and you, you know, and then you drop some nuggets. I mean, regardless of what it is, when you want to succeed in an industry or an entrepreneur, you still had to put in hard work. You went out there and hustled, gave out tapes, did what you had to do, network, because nothing happens staying home. Nothing. And you went Nothing. out there and you paved the way. You believed in your talent and you ended up rising to the to the top levels. Now, who are some of the famous actresses you've worked with in the past? I know you did. With, you worked with Sylvia Saint. Oh, Sylvia Saint, Tara Patrick. Kira Tara Kenner. Patrick. These are huge, huge names in the industry. Yeah, Jesse Jane, Riley Steele, Caden Cross. You know, I mean, every one of them basically. Asia Carrera, even before she retired, we worked together. That's literally the top echelon of of the porn industry at that time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're definitely an A-lister on the male side yeah. of it. Well, I remember it was, it was, it was, it was sort of funny. This was back in, I would say 2000, yeah, 2001, 2002. Um, I was, uh, you know, because back in that day, uh, Vivid, you know, they, it was like the top company for any woman to be contracted with, right? You were a Vivid girl. It was a big deal back then. And, uh, and you went into the production manager, um, her office and she'd have, all the girls, like they'd, they'd be stickied on her wall and under every girl, it had the list of guys that she would work with. Cause you know, the, the contract girls, they chose the guys, like the guys had no choice. Like you were either on their list or you were not. And I remember her telling me, she goes, she goes, she goes, guess what? She goes, cause they had, you know, a new roster of girls. She goes, you're the only guy that's on every girl's list. Wow. Yeah. So that was, that was cool. Um, and was again, you think you, you attribute that to you trying to always make them feel have a really good time while you're doing it. And, you know, it, it's really everything, right? Like, so it's, you know, gr cause girls will want to work with guys based on a number of factors. One, how good of a performer are you? Right. Because we used to always say this and it still is true. Even today, the girl sells the movie, the guy sells the scene. So, you know, it, and it's the same thing with these websites today. Like you pick, uh, you know, if it's, you know, Brazzers, Reality Kings, whatever. Like the reason a guy is signing up is because of the hot girl. Like that's why he's putting in his credit card. The reason he's coming back is because of the scene that is delivered by her. And that is all attributed to the guy she's with. Because you can have, you can have the, you know, I, I, I often say this, I said, well, women are like Ferraris, right? But there's a big difference if you put the janitor, janitor of the local high school behind the Ferrari or you put Michael Schumacher. Same car, but trust me, one guy is just driving around the block and one guy's doing the, you know, Nuremberg ring at like 200 miles an hour. So, so that, that is the big difference, right? It's like, okay, well, they want to, they want to obviously look their best so that they can obviously become even more famous because, you know, the better they look on screen, the more famous they get as women too. So with time you work with a lot of them, maybe more than once, right? Yeah. Becomes a lot yeah, easier. You, 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 becomes you a lot quickly, easier, friendlier, funner. Does it take some of the stress off? It's interesting that you say that. I'll, I will say, there's two things I will say about that. Usually, I think, if you're talking pure performance, probably the best scene you do with somebody is the first scene. Because there's a raw, there's a raw sort of newness. There's an animalistic, tendency to it there's just a lot of things that come come into play the first time you sleep with somebody then after that it becomes what do you know about them 
right? So then it's personality, you know, where you can push them, you know, what they're capable of, you know, where to pull back. But I would still say from a raw energy level, I would say probably the first time I've worked with the girls has been the best because it's just, you have the, you know, it's the same thing. Like anybody, they take somebody home. It's like that first, there's so much sexual tension, you know, it's like, it's like, it's literally like a bomb ready to go off. Right. So if you embrace that, it's like that first time that you sleep with somebody it can be like, wow, you know, over the moon. Um, and it's not to say that it, it can't be really good later on, but I'm just saying that, that, that tension is never, you never repeat that tension that you had that very first time. So you do this career, you start making some really good money. Mm -hmm. And what did you not like about it? Maybe, I mean, did you, did you feel any, was there anything you didn't like about the, the industry? Oh well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you do eventually, you get tired of people telling you what to do, like in a sexual space, right? Like, you know, when it, when it goes on for years and years and years and, um, you know, one of the things that I always found mattered the most actually on set wasn't, it wasn't the girl, it wasn't the company, it was the director or the producer. Because to me, a, a, a really good director, they knew and they understood to really be a fly on the wall. Like if you're hiring me, like you're hiring me and you're hiring a, an A-list top actress, the best thing that you should do is not tell us anything. Like your best like course of action is to just hit record and shut up because we will make shit happen, you know? And that's when you get something that's real, right? Because, you know, does all always force. Say, oh, porn's fake. Well, yes and no. I mean, trust me, there's, there's a lot of reality that does happen. Um, and I find the reality that happens is really based on the producer because, you know, if they, if they just capture what's going on, then, you know, me and me and the actress will be getting into our own fantasies. We'll be doing whatever's making us horny, you know, and it comes across that way. I mean, you can't, you can't deny the, the fact that it comes across on screen. You know, if you're genuinely, if you generally want to fuck the shit out of somebody like that shows up on the camera. You know, but if they're constantly like, cut, let's do this, uh, let's set up this shot, let's, you're like, okay, like you become like a robot, right? You're like, okay, what shot do you want? Oh, yeah, this one, okay, well, let me get my dick card, yeah, let's do this, right? <laughs> like, so you, you can go through the motions, so it really, but that's all based on who whose production it is, you know, so. How many films do you think you've done in your life? Oh, you the man. ballpark, hundreds, thousands? Oh, no, it's thousands for sure. I mean, it's it's so funny because there's no way to really track it. Um, there is a website that it tries to track it, but it's not it's not reliable at all. It's called IAFD. I think if I, I'd have to look, honestly, I think last time I went on there, I think it was like, it showed I was like in 2,900 or 2,600. I don't know like that. But that's movies. That's not women, right? Would you do print work too? Or was it only film? Would you, would you be in magazines and pictures? Or was it mostly just... Back in the day, yeah, I used to I used to do a lot of stuff for Penthouse um, Club Magazine a lot. I remember back in the day, Suze Randall, she used to shoot all the club stuff, and I worked for Suze a bunch when I was young, you know, because especially then, you know, I had a I had a complete baby face. I mean, nobody even thought I was old enough to do the job. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it was good, good times. What's the craziest scene you've ever done, and what's the most amount of people you've ever did? at the same time for a video oh well the second one's easy the second one is easy that was 101 so there's a movie out there that was actually by vivid it was called because they did this series where the first one they did was called the world's luckiest man and that was the the late john doe then they did world's luckiest black man that was mr marcus then they did world's luckiest patient that was bobby vitale and the fourth and final movie they did was called world's luckiest jock and that was me and it was me and 101 cheerleaders so, yeah, that was that 101. Were, 101. Yeah. And how long was this session for? And how long was this shoot? Do you remember? It was four days. So it was four days. And it was like, man, it was like 13 hours a day or something like that. Crazy. It was long. <laughs> I mean, it was basically like from morning till night. And it was, it was definitely one of the hardest shoots I've done because so not only was there the volume, 
you know, I did, I did each day cause I wanted to beat the record, you know, cause I'm competitive. Right. So it's like, you know, the, the previous best was someone had done, um, uh, it was like 10 or 11 cum shots. So I'm like, that's it. I'm doing 12. Right. So I was doing three cum shots a day. And because at the time, um, they had a policy about the fact that the company only used condoms. Right. So I had to use a new condom with every single girl. So I actually had my own condom PA, like there was a guy who was just paid to just be sitting there unwrapping condoms and like handing them to me, like, because every time, like you got to change it out fast. You know, it's like, uh, you, know, you think about F1, how they do the, the tires really quick, right? That was me with condoms that day. <laughs> it's like, swap it out, next one in. So yeah, it was crazy, crazy day. You touch an important uh, question and you made, made me just want to make sure I remember that. Were you ever scared of sexually transmitted diseases? Did you know of other adult stars that contracted the disease? And, and what was that like being in the industry? Yeah, well, you know what? And, and this is what was sort of interesting because there's there's a lot of different things with that, right? So, you know, when I was a kid, yeah, you're like, you're absolutely terrified, right? Like I remember when I had to get my first, my first HIV test, it was like, oh my God, right? Because I think at that point, like I, I you know, I, this was before porno. And I think like there was like two girls I had slept with like one time each without a condom. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to die. Like for sure I've got it. Right. And then your test comes back negative. You're like, Phew. I mean, even people that are just even a little bit active, not even as crazy as what you did, but just a little bit, you know, they've had 10 partners, let's say they're, they're shitting bullets too. You know? Yeah. 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 So, so then, you know, when you got into the business, like you start, here's the interesting thing. And I never know how to tell people this. There's, there's really two sides to it, right? There's the, there is the health aspect to it, but then there's also the propaganda aspect to it. And you really have to separate the two. Um, so, you know, because everybody can say X, Y, Z is going to happen to you. Right. But then you're in it and you're, you know, you're in the experience and you've got the boots on the ground knowledge and you're like, wow, everybody says X, Y, Z is going to happen, but I've never seen X, Y, Z happen, right? So, so that really started to change my, my opinion of things. Not only that, I really got to, I don't know that I'm going to call it a sort of spiritual at peace place, but you know, you really do have to come to, to peace inside with what you do and accept all the consequences, right? And that could be anything like, you know, hey, you, you, you work on a construction site. Well, there's, you know, chances are you're going to be fine. But do people die on construction sites every year out there in the world? Yes. You know, um, do people that are work on a fishing boat, do they, you know, drown? Do, you know, I mean, all these things happen. Every job that has a little bit of danger, like you're like, well, we were as safe as we can be. But you have to you have to at least understand and accept that it can happen. And the thing is, you can't, I don't think you can do any of those jobs functionally, if you're terrified all day long. Okay, I don't think you can, right? Like, like, like for me, I, I fucking hate heights back, like hate them. Okay, you would you wouldn't catch me on one of those construction cranes if you paid me, like, I'd be like, fuck this, man, I'm not gonna be, you know, 30 stories up, you know, with some little rope around me on the edge of a, of a glass building. But I guarantee you the people that do it, probably they're not thinking they're going to die. They're just like doing their job and that's it. And it's the same thing. Like if you work in porno, like if you're really going to be good at it, you just can't have those thoughts in your head. Like you got to do the job and then just be okay with, you know, Hey, if, if anything goes wrong, well, I made the choice to be here. And I just accept my choices. I think that's the only way you can functionally deal with it because there's, there's no way if you, every day you went to a scene, you thought, Oh, today could be the day that I get HIV or I die. You're never going to have a heart on, Like you're just not, you're just going to be like, man, I'm too scared. You know? And if, if you're too scared, better to find a job that doesn't scare you. Did you ever have any close calls? With, with sexually transmitted diseases? Yeah. Did you contract well, you anything? Was, I mean, is it, funny. what are the odds you don't get nothing though? You didn't catch on even like the, you know, Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I mean it, there's, there's nobody in the business that, that, that has never come across chlamydia or gonorrhea a couple times in their life for sure. I mean, you know, I think, I think if, it's they, common. if they say they haven't, they're lying. Um, the clap but, as they call it, right? The clap. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. But I mean, you know, that, that's the other thing too, you know, it's, you, you get these things where it's like, oh my God, you know, you're, you're going to die. And it's like, no, you're going to take some antibiotics for a week and then you're going to be fine. Um, you know, I did have um, once, and this was, this was very much a, um, not come to Jesus moment, but I mean, it was definitely, it really went to that kind of spiritual place where I'm talking about, because, you know, one time um, I get this call. And they're like, there's a problem with your test. I'm like, what's the problem? And they say, well, you know, it says HIV positive, but we think it's a false positive. I was like, all right. And you're having that like, no. And then, but you know, at the same time, I was like, well, I've never done anything that's crazy. Like I just go to work. So if, if it was true, I got it on set from somebody, which I don't believe was the case, right? I'm not out there doing drugs. I'm not out there doing something crazy. So I, but at the same time, like you're sitting there thinking, well, okay, how do I deal with this if it is true? And that was really the thing. I'm like, well, okay, you know, am I, am I okay with the choices that I've made in life? Right. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, I can't, I can't sit there and say like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting there um, that my choices would have changed. Right. Like from that perspective, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm solid with the decisions I made and it's all up to God. And, uh, you know, it was like three days later, they call me and they're saying, yeah, yeah, it's false positive. We reran the blood and it's all good. Um, but yeah, so that was my close call as far as that, as, as far as that goes. You were shitting bricks for a few days, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But, but it was, it was fascinating because I, like I said, I mean, unless you've been there, you, you can only think about it from that kind of spiritual place. Like, it's like, okay, well, you know, I'm. I'm responsible. It's all up to God. And, and, I, and I'm okay with the decisions I made that got me here. Right. So, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, it was fine. So there was a, there was a, you know, it was like an almost like an internal shitting bricks, but was I having some kind of breakdown or something? No, because like I said, it's not like, it's not like I was sitting there going into it with my eyes closed. Right. Like I went into the business with my eyes pretty open, especially, you know, by the time that came around, um, I'd been doing the business a long time. So, I mean, you mentioned God. Yeah. Do you believe in God? Yeah, I do. It's, yeah. it's sort of interesting, actually, because. Um, and from a spiritual should... level, you don't feel like, you know, technically these are what you're, you know, from theological perspective, what you're doing is considered lust and uh sins of the flesh and can be punishable by hell and all. I mean, the, the, what's your thoughts and opinions on that? I'm just curious. Yeah. So it, that is interesting. The fact that, uh, yeah, I, I definitely believe, um, I believe in God. I believe there is being a good person. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting too, you know, just the, the stuff that was shown to me in the ayahuasca journeys, but, um, I definitely do like, I would never say that porn is, good for society so it's like when people ask me they say well what are your thoughts and i say well i don't think it's as bad as people will say you know because you have the people that are like oh you know it's the worst thing in the world and then you also have people on the other side that say oh you know we're saving people's lives and i'll say no it skews net negative like if if negative 10 is you know we're all going to hell and positive 10 is we're saving every marriage it's a negative two you know and and again that that was sort of what you know, what was behind my whole, yeah, let's call it like little spiritual existential crisis that we talked about at the beginning, right? It's like, well, okay. It's like, I understand, you know, what I'm doing is not obviously a, a real net benefit for society. I don't believe it's a, it's a huge negative, but it's not like I'm, I'm changing people's lives. Right. But you know, when I work with men and stuff like that, like I do change their lives, right? Like I, I, I get to help men, I get to connect with them. I get to use and it, it it's really that sense of you know like i'm using all that i went through so they don't have to because you know fundamentally they can get all that knowledge without having to do anything that i did you know they can just have the knowledge and i think that's important a lot of these women you dealt with and i think there's this perception that um not so much from the male perspective but maybe f judgment on the female side meaning a lot of people feel like a lot of these porn stars or the women may have come in from broken homes or they're lacking or they're whatever the case may be in your experience 
do you feel that there was any commonality of why these women enter? I mean, I know it's a, it's a pretty difficult question, but did you notice any negative maybe causes, you know, as a day, some people would call stripper syndrome or anything like that? I mean, do, do you feel a lot of them came from broken homes or abusive relationships or they had been traumatized in their past? I mean, from the ones you got to know, at least, I mean, do you, would you ever talk to each other and say, well, why did you get in or why did you get out? I mean, did you ever date any of these women? I mean, yeah, no, I've, I've, dated, I've dated a lot of women. And here's the thing that I will say. And, you know, I mean, it's all opinion, right? So it's not like I'm saying this is the point. I know it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to generalize, but, you know, everyone's different in the reasons yeah. they get in. But your perception, at least from your experience. Yeah, so, so from my perception, I don't believe anybody... There's nobody who gets into porno that's not broken at some level. And I'm, and I'm saying guys are the same, right? Like, I, okay. I don't think so it's don't on think both it's sides. a path you go down if there's not something. And it's not to say because people like to, they like to go to the extremes and they're like, oh my God, someone must have raped you as a child or abused you. No, no, no. It could be as, as simple, as, it could be as simple as they just want attention. Yeah, it could have been, uh, you know, you were bullied when you were in school. It could have been, you know, dad didn't give you any attention, you know. Um, so, so it can be something really innocent. Like I said, I mean, you know, a lot of the life changing things that happened to us happened between like one and three years old, right? Now, the commonality that I've seen with women, it's always been a daddy issue. So that that's, you know, if you were to say a theme, and like I said, like, now, when you, you say daddy issue, did you feel that like a lot of them did not have a relationship with their father or they had a horrible relationship with their father or they just had no relationship with their father? It's always a mixture. And that's why I say, like, you can't, you know, people want to go to this, like, uh, horrific, um, you know, nth degree of it, which isn't true. Like, I've known, I've known girls where it's like, hey, you know, she just never talked to her father. Her father was always working and wasn't really in her life. Or, you know, her father, you know, gave all the attention to the son and none to her, you know, so it's like, there's all different levels of it. But it was always, in my opinion, and what I saw, it was always, you know, there was always that connection with, with, with the father, you know, they just didn't have that. They didn't have that strong, masculine figure that I think women need. And, and this is why I say, you know, as I've gotten older, I've, I've started to kind of parse this out. Because if you think about it, right? Like that, that, that sort of relationship, you know, between a, a, a father and a daughter will never be replicated anywhere else. Just like the same between a mother and a son. Right. And what I mean by that, like if you were to if you were to just look at your own mother, right? Like there's no other woman out there that's ever actually going to like take care of you like your mom. Like it doesn't exist. Right. You know, on every other level, when you're going to have some sort of relationship with a woman, you're going to need to protect her. You're going to need to take care of her. Like there's no time where you get to just relax, take your foot off the gas and say, hey, you know, <laughs> let's make it all about me. That's only mom. And in the same situation with you, when you look at, at, at daughters and their fathers, you know, the only man that is probably never going to have any um, sexual eyes for you is going to be your dad. You know, once he's gone, every other guy out there is going to have some intention. The only, the only pure, you know, intention between a, a you know, a, 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 a man and a woman in that context is going to be your dad. Cause he's going to be like, that's pure love. You know, every other guy is going to be like, well, you know, ooh, nice ass, you know, this, that, right. You know, we're guys. So it's, it's on both sides. I think, you know, you, the, that relationship between the, the, the son and the mother is very important. And the relationship between the, the, the father and the daughter is extremely So important. you notice the common theme even on the male side of it, right? Yeah. Same I thing. mean, well, the, the themes that I always saw with guys was a little, and cause I, I never went into their, um, psychological makeup so much but the best actors always came from two categories and this is we're talking pre pre viagra pre this right the the two categories that i saw was you had the category of guys that were they had grown up um and gone into stripping so they were very exhibitionist right so you had the exhibitionist camp because back in the day, you had a lot of guys that came from being male strippers. Chippendales. Yep, lots of Chippendales, lots of Chippendales. And then you had the other camp where it was, it was uh, the guys that that had a chip on their shoulder because 
when they were young, they were kind of ignored by women. And so then, you know, they were super horny and they were just able from a psychological perspective to block out everything. And I think on, on some level, I think they actually ended up becoming the best performers, right? Cause, cause it was just, you know, it, it's all mental, you know, like, uh, it, 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 there are physical attributes, but at the end of the day, sex is 90% mental, no, 95% mental. I, I would have to agree with you. Yeah. And I'm back lover. I might not be a porn star, but I'm back lover. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But, um, your parents, Eventually, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they find out what you're doing for a living. I mean, did this create tension? What was that like? Were they embarrassed? Were they ashamed? I mean, yeah, I've always you know wondered. I mean, so this, funny is, about that is, this is fascinating stuff to me, man. Like, what it was like. I've always wondered what is it like when you're a porn star and your parents find out. And oh man, I'll, I got I got the best story for you, Beck. I got the best story for you. So, uh, I had gone down to LA, right? And uh, of course, I was there like two weeks. So I got to come up with an excuse, right? Like, I'm, I'm down in LA. So um, I call my mom and I say, hey, I'm on vacation with some friends, right? That was my first lie. So I'm like, yeah, I'm on vacation with some friends for a couple of weeks to LA. And, you know, and the thing about my mom too, you know, it's like, fuck, of all the women I've ever met, she is the sharpest I've ever met. Like, I, you know, from that perspective, growing up as a kid, I had the worst mom because like, man, if I got caught drinking, I got caught smoking, I got caught doing anything fuck she she would just look at me and she would just go uh-huh and she'd just see it in my <laughs> eyes right and you'd just be like oh fuck i'm busted right like man i got busted for everything so here i am i'm lying right i'm like hey, I'm down in la for a couple of weeks and uh you know so now some more time goes by because now i'm there for a month right so i got a new story so i'm like i tell my mom I'm like yeah uh, well you know i'm gonna stay down here i got a job as a bartender i've never fucking poured a drink in my life right but i'm like coming up with all this shit so she's like, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> so probably another couple of weeks goes by. I don't think I was there for more than a month and a half. And uh, so I call up my mom. We have a normal, totally normal mother-son conversation for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes back. At the end of the conversation, before I'm about to hang up the phone, she says this. She goes, so I hear you're doing movies. Mm. Just like that, bro dead silence on my end. I was just like, oh. what do I say? Yep. <laughs> and, and literally that's all I got from her. She could just, after, as soon as I said, yep, she just went like this. She goes, uh-huh. <laughs> just wanted to let me know. Just, just, just another, like another fucking nail in me saying, yep, you're not getting one over on the old woman. I know exactly what you're up to. And, um, yeah. She didn't that, say nothing. Uh, she didn't say stop or don't do this or have you thought about what you're doing or nothing? No, and you know what's so funny? And I got, I have to commend her and we actually talk about this today. We had this discussion like within the last five years because me and my mom got really close the last five, six years and we'd have these discussions. And she said to me, she was really honest. She says, look, she goes, you were 22 at the time. She goes, you're a grown man. You're going to make your own decisions. She goes, I'm not there to, to tell you what you can and cannot do. You know, if that's what you want to do, she was like, go do it. Uh-huh. So, she's like, yeah, go. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then, and do then you she think, saw I mean, how much money do, I was making and how it worked out for me and everything. So she was, she was fine with that. Do you think she's ever watched your work, bro? And do you know if she has? Don't lie. No, no. My mom would never. Uh-uh. How do you no know? Because I know my mom. I know my mom. And the other thing, too, it's like, oh, come on. My she's mom, like, that's my, my son. Look what he's doing. in the house. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I said my mom's seen me naked walk around the house so many times. Like it's nothing new, right? Like growing up, growing up, uh, you know, as a kid, um, it's not like it was a nudist house, but just like my 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 brother and me, like we never slept with pajamas on. So that that was something that I think really helped me because I never I never had that shame about being naked because like when I was a kid, it's like I was just always naked. So you know, when I got older. It's like I wouldn't get naked because someone else would have a problem with it, but me personally, I I didn't give a shit. I was like, yeah, whatever, right? No problem. So basically, reconnecting this full circle, going back to the beginning of the conversation, you do this for years, you make it to the top, you make a living for yourself, but you're feeling kind of a little like, what the, the point of life? I did this now. Is this all there is to life? Basically, right? Mm -hmm. You go on this mission with the um, linguistic 
you know, NLP. Neuro, neuro, yeah, yeah. NLP. Then you go into ayahuasca. You take some journeys. Yeah. Where are you at this point in your life, spiritually and mentally? Oh man, I'm in a great place now. Um, you end up in the Czech Republic. You know, we covered that yeah. earlier. Yeah, you're over here. You're retired. Uh, from, no, not fully yet. So we might see Eric Everhard another time. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, because um, you know, I'm, I've still been in because I, I launched my new business a year ago. So it's been that uh, you know, there's that transition period. Um, but I spent uh, I spent three years, locked myself up, wrote the book, right? And, and the book was, is uh, the book is called. Uh, Unleash Your Sexual Superpowers, A Porn Star's Guide to Sexual Mastery. And is it available on uh, Amazon? Yeah, it's av- on Amazon. Okay, we're going to we, put the link. On Kindle, Audible. All right, so you're on Kindle too. We'll put the links down here below. So it's Unleash. Yeah, Unleash Your Sexual Superpowers. So you're basically like a, a sex coach, male enhancement coach, right? Yep. Yeah, so that's what I've been doing now the last year is um, just working with clients. And, and so now I'm in the process of building building an educational platform and just, uh, just sharing so the do, knowledge, right? What do you help men with? Be better in bed, control their thoughts? Oh, man, everything from, um, from performance anxiety, like what are the mindsets? Because like what I started doing is I started looking, okay, why was I one of the top three in the world? Because there were lots of guys that weren't very good or they were so-so and they never, like they were never consistent. Like I've, I've done what, I don't know, how many thousands of scenes? I have never failed a scene. And I've never taken Viagra and I've never done any of that crazy shit. So I was like, okay, there's something clearly that I'm doing that works from a mental standpoint, you know, and it's, and it comes down to, you know, there's so many things, right? It's like, well, okay, you know, how you practice is how you play on the field. You know, that's number one. So when it comes to performance, it's like, well, okay, you've got supplements, you've got diet, you've got food, you've got exercise, you've got penis exercise, you've got all this different stuff that I used to do all the time right? To be, again, to be at that top level, because that's what it takes. Like you, if you're just going to sit around and, you know, eat Cheetos all day, it's like, well, if Tom Brady did that, like he's not going to have seven Super Bowls, right? So you have to really look and say, okay, well, and what not to do mention, I have to do to perform in the bed as best as possible? And you do have a, a long history of working out too. So you know how to put together workouts. I mean, it's, it's a whole package thing, basically from males yeah. to, to rise up. Yeah, exactly. Do you, do you also work with women? Uh, you know, I have, but you prefer, uh, prefer with one, with one woman, but typically, no, typically it's all men. Okay. So it's for men. So if you're a man out there and you're really trying to take your sex life to the next level, your appearance, your, your health, your mental cognition, maybe mm-hmm. performance, clarity, focus. I mean, seriously to do what you did. Oh, it's is, all, oh man. I mean, listen, focus is something that I talk about a lot, you know, put anybody in a room full that, of strangers. Most men, like you said, I agree with you. I think your number's right. You're not getting up, man. You're not. Because it is mental. You're like, all these people, I don't even know them. They're looking at me. I'm naked. It's just a lot of, you got to have a very strong mind to be able to to do what you've done and to do it as consistently as you've done. I have to agree with you. Yeah. Well, it really is, at the end of the day, it's it's your ability to not only focus 100% on what are you doing, right? It's able to focus 100% on the sensations that you're experiencing because that's what happens to a lot of guys, right? It's like they get in their head and literally they don't even feel they have a, they, they don't even feel they have a dick, right? It's like, it's like not even part of them anymore, right? So it's like, okay, well, you gotta, you gotta first, you gotta feel yourself, right? You have to block out all of the negative thoughts, negative emotions, those things that are going to cause you adrenaline. Well, okay, how do we do that? Well, we, we, we focus on doing, right? I always talk to people. I said, you need to be doing things to the woman so intently that you that you become free in your mind. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at, let's look at meditation, for example, right? Like, well, you know, you're saying a mantra or you're focusing on your breath, but it's, it's always the same theme. It's like, it's this intense amount of focus to have it so you have no thoughts in your brain. You know, and a lot of times I would, I would bring it back to my time with, with weightlifting. You know, I, I'll tell someone, I say, you put 300 pounds on a bench press, ask me what you're thinking about when that thing comes down. <laughs> there is no like, hey, what am I eating for dinner? There's no, uh, geez, do I need to pick up the kids from school? It's like, no, man, you are 100% focused on moving that because it's going to crush you. And it's that level of focus that you have to bring to the bedroom. Because when you have that level of focus, now you're not going down to the, the negative rabbit holes that aren't going to you know serve you, which is you know 
you know, God, I hope I get hard. Oh, what is she thinking of me? Uh, I hope she likes this. Uh, oh no, here we go again. Like all that shit, it doesn't serve you. So you need to just cut it off, block it and move on and focus on what you're doing. Because when you focus on what you are doing and you're getting into what you're doing, now you're not having any thoughts in your brain. You're doing it in the most raw level there is. I mean, you're doing it literally physically and you're showing the, 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 the concept of mind over matter, mind over body, right? Yeah. Which can be used in every other aspect of life, like not to eat bad, to work out, to get past anxiety or stress, to be, you know, to use your mind, which is the most powerful organ you have. Yep. I think yeah. this is a great placement. I think people should read your book. I think it's fascinating stuff. We don't want to give them too many nuggets. We're going to give them one gift before we sign off. What is a trick that men can do to last longer in bed naturally? Just like if they, they don't want to maybe, you know, climax, they don't last as long. What can they do to like last just a little bit longer? I'll, I'll give them two, two of the dirty biohacks that, that I use um, because there's, there's things that I do to alter neurology, but those are long-term fixes. Two immediate fixes that you can do. Number one, pain, right? Uh, if anybody's ever had, you know, for example, like you have a headache, right? If you go st stub your toe on the coffee table, like you don't have a headache no more. And pain is one of the most things, like it's the most useful thing if used properly. And so when I'll teach guys how to use pain, I'll use it within positions because that way you stay connected to the woman. You stay, she doesn't know anything's changed. And you're able to give yourself just enough pain that you no longer have the feeling to climax. That's number one. And the second one that you can use in between positions, and you'll use it like a sleight of hand. So you'll do it when the girl's not paying attention, is you will prevent your testicles from rising. Because when you're going to, when you're, you know, close to coming or you're about to come, your nuts are going to rise up almost like they're going up towards your body. If you pull them down, it, it, it's a quick biohack because they want, they have to go up for that come shot to happen. And that was something I learned early on in the business from some old veteran guys was like, you just pull those suckers down. You can give yourself another 30 seconds, another minute, another minute and a half. And ultimately where, where you want to get to is what I have always referred to as the five minute marker, because what I found was almost every porno actor, like if they started off in a scene really sensitive, if they could make it to five minutes, that was the time that your dick started to desensitize and you started to actually be able to get control of it. So I never tell guys like, oh, you got to last 30 minutes. I say, no, 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 last five minutes. Get to that five minute marker because the hardest part is that 0 0.5 seconds to five minutes. Once you get to five minutes, to get to 10 minutes, pff, way easier. If you make it to 10 minutes, pff, to get to an hour, super easy, right? Because that's interesting. you now gain control. Interesting. Yeah. Folks, we brought you into the world that many men have wondered what it was like to be in. We brought you someone that was at the highest level of that. We showed you the human side of the adult entertainment industry. We've showed you why you should buy this guy's book. The link's below. And I think we're going to hear some great things about Eric Everhard in the future. And I look forward to meeting you when this whole pandemic's over and you come to New York City and we'll share some real stories. And hopefully, we'll hopefully, forward to it, man. hopefully get you back on, man. I think you're fascinating and uh, just want people to know that no matter what you've been through in life, no matter how bad it may seem, no matter how impossible your journey may seem to you, as long as you never give up, and as long as you have air in those lungs, you can always make a comeback. A comeback, Eric Everhard. Fucking comeback. Eric Everhart, I know a lot of you are going to those naughty sites today to see who this guy is. I dare you to check him out. Google the name. He's here with the comeback team. Check out his book. And if you really want to change your life, reach out to this guy and he'll help coach you and make you a sexual master. This is Beck Lover, and we'll see you next time. Beck Lover.